regards to our next speaker, I'm a big fan of our next speaker. And I first heard of his work years ago when he wrote the book on metropolitan uh, planning. And uh, when we started the Metro CDO Sustainable Infrastructure Master Plan, I looked him up again um, and I uh, reviewed his book, uh, book again. And um, because there has not been really a lot of literature on metropolitan planning. Um, and then I sent him an email and to my surprise, he replied. And so it began a discussion for us for, uh, in terms of metropolitan planning. I had him check the reticular matrix I had done for Metro CDO. And finally, I met him last year at the ISOCARP conference in Jakarta. So our next speaker um, is, a, is a really is a big advocate of metropolitan planning. Uh, he was in charge of planning and urban management for the uh, metro metropolis of Madrid from 1988 to 1999. And he developed the strategic plan of Madrid from 88 to 94, as well as the Structural Plan of Madrid in 1996 to 2016. So you can actually check out his website, and he he uh, he will he will share this. Uh, he will he's he's glad to share this to everyone. No? He has also been the Lord Mayor of Madrid Central Business District or the Distrito de Salamanca, uh, the okay. Deputy Mayor for Urban Strategic Planning, as well as the Director General for Regional Metropolitan and Urban Planning for Madrid State. So since then, uh, nowadays he uh, works for the World Bank as well as the UN, um, as well as ADB, UN Habitat, and other international multilaterals. Uh, he also works for the European Na Union as well as the Government of India in strategic and structural planning of um, Indian metropolises. All right. So he has worked in 64 countries, and if you follow him on Facebook or Instagram, you will see that he is. Um, counting all of these nations that he's working in. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and he's also, in fact, in the Philippines, he has also, uh, he has also uh, organized an international, uh, a metropolitan, um, what do we call this, a group also who discusses uh, metropolitan regions in the Philippines. Mia, Mia, yeah. I was born in Manila. Really? Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to skip his academic bio because of uh, time constraints. However, I know a lot of my friends who studied in uh, Politecnico in Madrid was also under uh, uh, Pedro. Okay, so without much further ado, let's welcome uh, Pedro Ortiz. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mia. I, I am a fan of yours as well. <laughs> uh, uh, do we see the, uh, the slides? Yes? Yes. I, all right. So, uh, uh, Cagayan de Oro, the Golden River. What that's what it means in uh, in Spanish, Cagayan de Oro. No? Um, uh, in the history, I'm going to have a substantive approach to metropolitan planning. I'm going to talk about Madrid, but uh, I'm going to frame uh, the the metropolitan planning uh, needs and and approach uh, because really metropolis have uh, exploded since Second World War. And this is a new phenomenon, a new problem, and we have not yet built up the discipline. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the Milano Politecnico is working for the European Union, and the European Union is trying to build up that discipline, and that's going to be a part I am involved with that project, and that's part of what I'm going to, to, talk, to talk today. No? So in the uh, history of the world, there has only been uh, three uh, metropolises with uh, with uh, with uh, cities uh, with 700,000 people plus uh, Rome, uh, Beijing, and, uh, and and London. And now I cannot, I cannot, I cannot move. Oh, all right. And now there are 500. So we have gone from three to 500 in the 20th century. And. Uh, those 500 metropolises are extremely efficient. They produce 75% of the GDP of the world. So 75% of the GDP of the world is, is produced in those metropolises, and only 25% of the population of the world live on those metropolises. That makes that 25% of, of the population produces 75% of the output of the world. That makes those uh, people living in those metropolises uh, 16 times more efficient than people do not, that do not live on metropolis. And this is an effect that we will see of economies of scale and so on. So uh, this is the, the, the people, 24.5% uh, uh, of, uh, of the world population lives in, in, in metropolis larger than 1 million. And that's uh, the data that I was giving before. 
those metropolises are extremely powerful. They are as powerful as uh, nations. And if you put in red the metropolises among the nations uh, ranked by the GDP they produce, you see that the uh, nation number 14 would be Tokyo, the 15 New York, and so on and so on. No? Um, uh, 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 and so you see among the 100 most uh, uh, powerful, economically powerful uh, territories in, in the world, already 46 are metropolis and, and only uh, 54 are, are nations. And if you go into the next 200, they are mostly metropolis, no? because they really overtake nations in the economic power. So uh, those metropolis, uh, the issue is that they cannot be run as cities or even as an aggregation of cities. They have an entity of their own, which is different from urban, and which is different from municipalities, and they need a completely different approach to, to it. Those metropolis are uh, extremely efficient because, uh, as you see, the, the, as, as you grow twice the size of the metropolis, you need less effort to produce the same amount. Um, uh, it's, it's a metabolic uh, phenomena, but it's as well an economic phenomena. Um, uh, it's the economies of scale. The, the more, uh, the larger you are, uh, the, the, the more efficient you are because you maximize uh, capital investment, fixed capital and so on. No? We don't see well, I don't know why the graph to the left, but it is, we, 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 can, we can guess what it is. No? Uh, it's uh, the uh, pump stations, the petrol stations, in the uh, in seven in four uh, countries of uh, of Europe, France, Netherlands, and Spain, and, uh, and Germany, and you see uh, the this uh, depending on the size of the city, the larger the city is, the less need of number of petrol stations you need per population. That means that if you need less petrol stations because they are more efficient, they serve more people immediately that capital that you have invested in both those petrol stations and the people that work there, you can invest it somewhere else and then they can be more efficient and produce much more. So it's really uh, an issue. The, the size of the metropolis uh, provides a, 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 a larger output and, and more efficiency. As a matter of fact, there is even a figure for that. No? If you uh, double the size of a metropolis, a metropolis of 4 million people instead of 2 million people, that metropolis will be 15% more efficient than the other metropolis. No? And that doesn't mean that you have to, to, um, to, to invite 2 million people to live with you. Uh, it means that you have to integrate the market of that metropolis to be able to, um, to make it work as a single uh, market area and so on, and that's what it makes uh, the metropolis efficient. So that's why transport is extremely important in a metropolis. You cannot work like Bogota; it takes three hours and a half to go to your job. No, the metropolis of the world um, generally you get to your job in thirty to forty minutes. So if really you take more than one hour, then metropolis is not working at all. Metropolis is a complex system, like like countries. I'm, I always compare in metropolis to countries, and Singapore is a success because it has a metropolis, which is a national uh, metropolis. It's a country as well. So they can manage the, the, the complexity of the metropolis altogether, like, like a government of a, of a nation. And that's what metropolis need, a government that will look as much po as possible as a national government, rather than the aggregation of municipalities and, and cities. In a metropolis, you have four components, uh, the, the economic, the social, the uh, physical, and the, and the uh, governance. I am not going to talk about governance uh, of Madrid today, uh, because I'm going to focus on the physical, on the physical structuring of the metropolis. But let me say, as, as Nathaniel uh, mentioned, the governance of the, uh, of the Filipino uh, metropolises, let me say that metropolis do not have 400 million ways of managing them. Uh, like they are like countries, and countries you only have three ways of managing a country, which is a confederal a constitution, a federal institution, or a unitary institution. Uh, the Philippines is a unitary institution. And, uh, and so I am going to mention that in my next slide. And the unitary uh, is, um, constitutions, the unitary uh, nations, you have two ways of approaching uh, the uh, 
the, the management of the territory. The centralized one, which is that the ministries at the center make all the decisions, the health, uh, housing, uh, roads, and so on. And the decentralized one, and for example, France, France is a unitary decentralized because every department in France has a, a, has a préfet uh, appointed by the president uh, that, that really coordinates those ministries within that, that area of the department. No? But these are the only four ways you can really manage a metropolis. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the Philippine uh, approach is the unitary decentralized because the head of the president, I, I don't know, the CEO or whatever the name you give to the, the, the guy that runs the metropolises, uh, in the Philippines are appointed by the president and, and really they coordinate the, uh, the investments that the national and the other bodies and the transfers and so on produce in that metropolis. In Spain, no. In Spain, we are a quasi-federal system. Uh, the, the regions of Spain that we call communities have a lot of power. Uh, in Madrid, for instance, we make the planning laws. Uh, we make not only planning laws, many laws of our own. We make the, the uh, the metropolitan plan and we approve or disapprove uh, everyone each one of the master plans of the PO, uh, of the of the uh, municipal plans uh, a mayor cannot approve its plan if it doesn't it's not in accordance with with the vision of of the metropolis uh, from the from the uh, regional government no so um, the conf the confederate system doesn't work uh, the centralized system doesn't work either so the two systems that work are the uh, unitary decentralized or the uh, federal uh, federal system. Uh, the Philippines is uh, unitary decentralized, uh, bravo, that works. And Spain is more of a federal system, uh, which and, and the difference is who elects the CEO. You know, in, in a unitary decentralized is the president and the and a federal system is the is the population. Obviously, these four uh, components of the metropolis are more, much more complex than that. No, they are not just the governance social. Every one of them have a complexity within. I'm not going to get into that because it takes a long time. By the way, there is a, in online, there is a course on the metropolitan discipline, of free and online. And whoever wants to take that course, uh, uh, write to me and I will give you the the process and I will link you to, to, to the videos, it's 20 lessons, and that may be useful for, for you if you are really centering your job in metropolises. So it's much more complex, I'm not going to get into that, but I'm going to say that out of these four components, the physical environment is, is extremely important and that's it what I'm going to focus uh, right now. And in the physical environment, you have uh, two, uh, two types of elements, no? You have environment, you have transport, you have housing, you have productive activities and social facilities. And Singapore has been very precise describing how each of those elements work in, in Singapore. Uh, out of those uh, five elements, no, two of them are continuous systems, uh, environment and transport, and, and three of them are discontinuous systems, housing, productive activities and social facilities. Uh, being continuous or being discontinuous means that you cannot cut the transport. It has to be uh, in a continuous system. You, you cannot have a, a kilometer of train, then nothing, no tracks, and then another kilometer of train. It has to have a continuity. And when you arrive to the um, uh, uh, intermodal station, you have to get out of the train and you have to take a bus or a taxi or a bicycle or whatever. It has to be a system that has a continuity in physical terms. And environment as well, to, uh, to have biodiversity uh, within the, the environment system, it has to be continuous so the animals and the plants and so on, the pollen, the birds can, 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 can go through. So those are the two systems which are more difficult to coordinate in a metropolis because the other three, uh, they are systems, the housing, the health and so on are systems, but they, they do not have to be together linked uh, physically in the territory. They, they can be scattered within the, the areas that are best for, for each of them. So a metropolis really, the problem is how to coordinate transport and environment, because when you have a continuous system in the territory and you overpose, you impose the, the two of them, they are going to have uh, intersections and they are going to have conflicts. And if you put a highway that crosses a protected park, you have a problem there. So you have to solve that. And that is the basic of the, of the uh, physical uh, planning. Let me say, 
I was commenting these uh, two continuous systems and these three con these continuous systems. And we, we uh, shall uh, come back to how you have to manage that in, in a different way. Because the four components is when you make a strategic plan, hmm? when you deal with the economy, social governance and physical. But when you are dealing only with the physical one, you are doing a structural plan. So strategic is the four components, but when you deal with the physical is a, is a structural plan. And the way you deal with them are completely different. No? The strategic plan is what do you want your metropolis to be in 40 years time? What is the role of your metropolis in a national or an international uh, uh, structure of metropolis around the world? Because those 500 metropolis all work together, compete and collaborate and, and you must find the role that you have to play there. For instance, Madrid decided in the strategic plan of Madrid, decided that the role of Madrid in the world was going to be the bridge, the stepping stone between Europe and Latin America. And, and if, if that objective in the future of the metropolis is one sentence, it works very well. For instance, in Mumbai, doing the, uh, the uh, workshops, the brainshops with the uh, Indian government and so on, Mumbai decided that they want to be the capital of the Indian Ocean, the most important uh, economic center from Cape Town to Ho Chi Minh City. And then when, once you know what you want to be in life, when you grow older, then you, you, you set up the way of becoming that. No? And that's the structural plan, because the strategic plan sets up that objective, and then the structural plan uh, provides the basis, the territorial basis, to, to, to achieve that objective. No? And for instance, in Madrid, if you decide to be the stepping stone between Europe and Latin America, uh, you have to have an airport able to, to, to manage that. No? And, and we grew the airport to four runaways and, and that capacity of the airport made uh, possible to, to, have from, to go from 9 million passengers uh, uh, at the beginning of the strategic plan to 51 million passengers actually. So we multiply by, by four and something the number of passengers uh, when you have that vision and then you implement with the infrastructures that allow you to achieve that vision. In this slide, I am showing how different it is the management of a metropolis from a city. In a city, you have the mayor, you have the uh, deputy mayors, you have the chief of the departments, you have the services, you have the population. It's a pyramidal structure or an orbital one if you want the mayor in the center and then uh, ex the expanding circles around. No? And in the metropolis, it's not at all like that. A metropolis is a set of different institutions, obviously the 17 mayors in, in, in Manila, a set of different institutions, plus the agencies, plus the uh, ministries of the national government, and all of them, each of them has a competence in a democracy. They have competence that you cannot invade. Uh, you cannot tell a mayor what he has to do within, within his competence. He will decide on his own. So what you have to do is from your uh, system, organization, institution, is set up your goals and negotiate with the other institutions uh, how you can make those goals compatible and you, those projects and those, those uh, management and those uh, uh, compatible. So the metropolitan type of, of management is of governance is, is matricial, is, is all these institutions in the, uh, in the rows and in the columns that have to talk to each other and, and those talks and those agreements has been as transparent as possible for third parties that are interested in those outcomes to know how to act when those outcomes uh, come about and, 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 and to dialogue as well. No? So for instance, if you have to open a street because you have to put, put to the electricity, uh, the gas company should know that you are going to open that street because maybe they will use that moment to put the gas or to put something else. So it's a completely different where you have to respect the, the, the competences of each of the institutions. And that makes a completely different framework, much more like a nation like, uh, than, than, than a city. In, in a city, you have to have in that kind of pyramidal structure, the bottom up, top down uh, dialogue. Uh, the mayor has to listen to the population. The population has to listen to the mayor and, and, and you have to find a, 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 a vertical uh, dialogue that, that uh, produces the outcome of the policy making. In a metropolis, not at all, not at all, is a peer dialogue, is different institutions with 
each of them their own competences that have to dialogue to find a solution that will be the, the best for both of them and the best for the population. So it's a different approach. And the way you your plan with that kind of different governance, the way you plan in a, in, a metro, in a city, you have a regulatory plan, which every plot is, is, is defined as, as a hospital, as an industry, as a residence, as, as any facilities or a road and so on. And, and it is a relationship between the public sector and the private sector. The owner of the plot maybe doesn't want to make a hospital and will dialogue with you. No, no, I don't want, I prefer something else. And he will, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a negotiation between the private and the public. And, and, and obviously with the public has the final word because uh, the public is looking for the uh, general benefit and the private is, is looking for his private benefit. But you listen to that private and you have that dialogue. In a metropolitan governance system and a metropolitan plan, not at all. It's an inter-administrative process where all these uh, agencies and institutions, well, some of them can be private, some of them, but not private in terms of, of an individual firm. It, it is private because it's uh, the Chamber of Commerce or it is the confederation of businessmen. And that's a private association, but you listen to them and you dialogue to them because they are extremely important part within the framework of the future of the metropolis. But so you see, you have the strategic and structural plans, nothing to do with the master plans of a city. And you have a process of dialogue, which is a peer dialogue, inter-administrative, and not a relationship between the administration and the private, but at, among the different institutions of the uh, metropolis. And that's the point I was making before. The strategic plan looks at the four components altogether, and the structural plan looks at the physical component and focus on that. And that is the main difference between strategic plan and uh, structural plan, the way of planning a metropolis from the way of, of managing and planning a city. Madrid. Metropolis is a new dimension in, in in territorial management, a dimension that, as I mentioned before, is only 70 years uh, old, and so we are building up the, the knowledge, the, uh, the discipline of that, uh, of that dimension. Uh, all of us which are architects, I am an architect as, as well in origin, when you design architecture, you, you work at scale 150, especially the old architects as myself that computers did not exist in my, in my time, and we work on paper and with ink. Now the, the new architects zoom in, zoom out, and you never know anymore what, what, what scale are you designing. No, but architecture normally is designed at scale 150, urban design 1,500, urban planning 1,500, metropolitan planning 150,000, national 1,500, uh, continent. You, you plan it in a one, uh, uh, five million, and the world is 150 million. And each of them scales, the, each, of, each, each of those scales, have a different disciplines, no? Architecture, as we know, is uh, installation, uh, structure, space, light, and so on. But as you go into urban design, you, you start to, to introduce semiotics and engineering, and then in urban planning, sociology and, industry, uh, and uh, economics. And then if you go up, 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 um, and in, in you go to the world management, it's geopolitics. And, and the guys who do that is the G20. And, and you are talking about macroeconomics, geopolitics, and so on. And obviously the client as well changes, no? And uh, the client in an architecture is an institution or a family, and then in uh, urban planning is the municipality and national development is the, the government of the nation and so on as well. And when you reach uh, uh, the, the, the upper degree of 150 million of the world, then is the United Nations, uh, the, the Chinese Politburo, uh, the uh, World Bank and so on and so on. It's different clients, different disciplines, and you have to understand that those uh, scales have to talk to each other. You cannot work just in one scale. You cannot just do architecture. That architecture, that piece of architecture is in a, is, is in a street and you have to dialogue with a street and so on. So metropolitan planning has to dialogue with national development and has to dialogue with urban planning and has to have and uh, you even have to dialogue with higher degrees. No, I remember I was involved in a, in a plan in, in the mouth of the Panama Canal and the Chinese uh, government was trying to get control of that, of that physical uh, urban design plan because if you control the mouth of the uh, Canama, uh, Panama Canal, you are controlling 
all the trade between the East and the West Coast of the United States. So it was geopolitics at, at, at the level of, of urban design. Uh, so you have to dialogue and you have to understand all those, uh, all those uh, scales. And those scales apply as well for the different um, aspects of, of urban and metropolitan planning. For instance, when you deal with uh, transport, you have the, the larger scale of international transport, which is uh, airports, um, uh, planes, you have the national uh, level, uh, which is uh, uh, the trains, the regional one, the commuter trains, the metro, the BRT, the LRT, and, and even the pedestrian and the, and the bicycles. And what you have is to integrate all those scales within a system that, uh, as you see there, the, the, uh, the rectangles, the small rectangles, blue, yellow, uh, blue, red, and, and, and green, they are the intermodal stations when you come down from a plane and you don't take the bicycle. You come down from, from, a, from a plane and you take a regional plane and a, a regional uh, train. And then when you uh, leave the regional uh, train, you will take a metro or you will take then a taxi and so on. So that is the intermodal stations. And the metropolis, which is in the middle of that, has to dialogue with the upper scales and the lower scales. And this is an example of transport, but I could give examples of environment, of housing, and so on and so on. It, it applies to all of the approaches. So in a metropolis is a new scale and, and you have to integrate that scale with the urban one and with the urban design one, which is, which is centralities of those intermodal stations. And you have to have very clear that the disciplines in each of these uh, three scales are different and you have to adapt and they have to dialogue. And this is an example of how we did in Madrid. I'm not going to go into the procedures of how to deal with the urban scale or how to deal with the urban design scale, because there are many professionals that know about that and there is no need to, to go into that precision. But we must understand that there are different scales and because you are a specialist in one scale, you might not know exactly what is needed in the upper scale. No? Metropolis are metropolises because they are in a location advantage point. Um, if, if you are in the middle of a flat plane, in a featureless plane, as a central theory uh, used to mention, uh, you are not a metropolis because you are a village and so on. And a metropolis always is controlling some kind of interface between two uh, ecosystems, no? The crossing of a river like Paris, uh, the crossing of a, of a ridge of mountains like Colne, um, the, uh, the access to the sea uh, by, of, a, of a river like New York and and uh, due to the Air Canal in 18, 1830, uh, the, all the goods from central uh, the United States from the uh, Great Lakes went to New York. Also New York was the interface between the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean and, and America. And that what's made uh, New York what, what was New York and then the finance and so on. And, and London as, as well was the crossing of a river that uh, Julius Caesar had to cross to invade uh, uh, England. And, and the, the tides at that time, in Roman times, 2000 years ago, the tides of the Thames uh, reached London. Now they are much more further away. And that's why Julius Caesar built London there, because the bridges they had to, he had to build were much more efficient in that place than any other well. So, so you see, it's a location advantage that makes metropolis as metropolis and not a featureless plane, whatever. And when you have that location advantage, metropolis have always a main directionality because those geographical features, the coast, the river, the ridge of uh, mountains is a straight line. And that is the main directionality of the metropolis. Metropolis are never circular. They are never, never circular. I have worked in uh, 130, 150 metropolises and I have only found two or three which are circular out of 150. So really they are never circular. They have a main directionality and, and uh, Cagayan has a main directionality and we will say that later. And Madrid had a, a main directionality, which were the mountains and which was the, the, the foot, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, mountain foots that were different. And then you have a perpendicular directionality, which is the gradient of distance to that main feature. And generally you have these small rivers of affluence which are perpendicular to the sea. And then you have those kind of valleys and, and, and slopes that are perpendicular. And that is the feature of metropolises. And this is an example of it. These are 25 metropolises around the world. 
And this is the direction of the streets of those metropolises. And as you see, there is a main directionality on those streets and a perpendicular one. So metropolises are not round. Do not make ring roads around the metropolis because you are going against the DNA of the metropolis. And I can go into history. The, the guy that invented these wrong ring roads was, uh, uh, was um, uh, uh, I don't remember anymore. It was Vienna, 1912. Uh, Walter, no, Cristalo, no. Uh, uh, I don't remember, but 1912, and he uh, wrote, at that time, no one knew how to manage a big city. Uh, did, he, he, was, he called it uh, Großstadt, uh, big city, and he started to make ring roads, and then civil servants have copied that for a century, and every time there is a jam in the center of a city, they think about ring, uh, ring road. No, it doesn't work. It's not a ring road, what really makes a metropolis. Is a, is a reticular system with those two directionalities that empirically the previous uh, 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 thinking was more uh, uh, conceptual, what I mentioned, but you see that empirically the metropolis has a, have as well uh, a, a, a double reticular system. These are the, uh, the uh, th four types of metropolis setting, no? Either the coast, either a river, a pass among a region and a valley, uh, uh, and and I, you have there examples, New York, Mumbai, Paris, London, New Delhi, and so on. You have examples. Those are the, the types of, and, and Cagayan is obviously the coast approach. The, the system of a reticula of a grid, not a grid is too rigid. This is a reticula, uh, uh, an organic flexible reticula. It's much more efficient. We have no time to go into that, but it's much more efficient than a circle, because a circle creates congestion, a circle creates uh, land speculation, because the owners of the center can uh, ask for uh, their money uh, the amount they want, because the market is controlled by supply. And a market should never be controlled by supply, it should be controlled for the by demand to, to be an efficient market. And so really, the, the circle creates a lot of problems that we have to break. And we have to create metropolitan areas which are polycentric, not any more dependent on the center that controls the metropolis, but with different areas that, that, that have different functions, that have different clusters of industries of different type and relating to each other within that reticula is much more efficient. And uh, I can go on with the, uh, the, the unstable, uh, un unstable um, uh, Regis stability and so on, but uh, we have no time, so uh, I'm going to go uh, uh, skip that. In a metropolis, for example, we have a constant conflict between the economic and social. I mentioned before, no? If you concentrate, if you are larger and you concentrate economies of scale, you have a more economic uh, efficiency, a higher output, but then you are leaving the, the, the social classes which are less uh, well off, you are leaving them out of this kind of wealth produced in the areas which where capital is concentrated. So you have there that, anta that antagonism that economy tries to concentrate in the center, is the two wheels uh, the, down in this slide, concentrate in the center and social equity, you have to share among, among the population, we generally are in the periphery because they cannot pay the prices of the center. So you have that dichotomy of concentration for efficiency and, and distribution for social, uh, for, uh, for, for social equity. And obviously the way of breaking that kind of dichotomy between center and periphery is to create, sorry, this is the same, uh, but it is in Spanish. The way of breaking that kind of dichotomy is creating this kind of system with polycentric areas, each one of them with their um, uh, specialization and in the, in the interstitial spaces between you can allocate those social groups that are not wealthy enough to pay for the center, but can be uh, in, into that kind of system, reticular system and closer to the social facilities that they will need and that they will uh, gold and that they will want to, 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 to benefit from. So you have this kind of new approach to metropolitan planning that we are introducing in many metropolises around the world is not anymore concentrating uh, uh, in, in circles, is a reticular system. And to remember uh, that, I, I like to use images 
to, to, to get the ideas. We are not anymore playing darts in Metropolis. We are not just trying to get into the center because it's the highest value, the center. No, we are playing chess in a metropolis. We are not anymore playing darts, we are playing chess. And playing chess means that each of those uh, pieces of the, of the uh, metropolis, of the different cities, uh, remember that the definition of a metropolis is not a conurbation, is not the built space, uh, the border of the built space, that's not a metropolis. A metropolis is a set of urban units that share a daily significant commuting. So they do not have to be conurbated. They should not be conurbated. You should not have the emergence of the urban areas because then you don't have the environment that goes through and you need that environment to go through to have the environment close to the residential areas and to, to other functions of the metropolis. So a metropolis is not a conurbation. That is the metastasis. That is the cancer of a, of a metropolis. And we see that in, in Manila. Manila, obviously, has had a metastatic approach of conurbation, and that's not the way of managing a metropolis. You have to have the unit separated with the interstitial areas with, with green and, and environment. So it's a set of urban units that share a significant daily commuting because they are an economic and social unit. And each of those urban units have a role to play, and that's the role of the pieces on, on, the, uh, on the chess. The king obviously is the historical center, but the queen generally is the most important piece that creates the strategy of the metropolis. And mostly in most metropolis, which are global metropolis, the queen is the airport and the uh, airport cities and the big firms that are using base economy, which are exporting and so on. And then the pawns are small uh, municipalities. And this is, for example, the game of chess of Madrid that, uh, that we, we introduced. And whenever a mayor came to the uh, metropolitan uh, office and uh, we tell, look, your role in the metropolis is to be a knight or a bishop or a pawn or a rook, no? And you must understand what is your role within the strategy of the whole metropolis and play your role, uh, your role right. If you want to play another role, that's up to you, but you're going to spend a lot of money of the budget of your citizens in things that are not going to work. If you're a small village, you cannot be you cannot build an Olympic stadium because that doesn't fit. So if, if, if you want to really benefit from the metropolis and provide to the metropolis in a, in a dialogue, uh, play your role well, well, and that will be the best for your, for your population. Uh, so at the beginning, um, uh, even villages, even, even the huts, prehistoric huts and so on were round, and the villages were based on, on round huts, but the interstitial spaces between those huts had a value because they were under the control of the palisade for defense. And that value was lost in a circle of system, which is now what the metropolis are trying to do, the small circles uh, with uh, ring roads and so on, that doesn't work. And in a natural way, uh, in history, we went from those hats, round hats, to a reticular system, not thought about, not imposed. It was a natural way of, of organizing that space, interstitial space, in a much more efficient way that, that the uh, amount of space lost uh, between the circles. So we went into a reticular system in a natural way. It was not um, uh, decided rationally. But then later on, we really analyzed that the, this reticular system was the most efficient one. And a long history. The first uh, image is Hippodamus de Mileto in Greece, 2,500 years ago, then the Romans, then the Chinese, then the Spaniards in Latin America, that's Buenos Aires and so on. The reticular system is the more efficient compared to a circular system. And only in the history of the world there has been a circular approach, um, intellectual circular approach, which was in the Renaissance uh, in, in Italy. It was the ideal cities they tried to make uh, they tried to make uh, round cities and so on, the Filarete and the, the team, and they were a, a, a failure. As a matter of fact, they had to take uh, uh, people in prison to go to live in those cities, because that kind of city, you have the power in the center, the panopticon, and those of you which are architects, we use that kind of uh, uh, circular approach, orbital approach in three types of uh, buildings, uh, hospitals, jails, cemeteries, and parks. And why? Because in, in none of those buildings, the client can, can protest. No? In hospitals is uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the patient, in jails is obviously the inmate, cemeteries is the body, and parks are the, the, 
the, uh, the, uh, the trees and none of them have the ability to, to, to discuss the decisions which are made by the center that controls. But the city is different. In a city, every one of us is free to do what it wants. So we cannot have this kind of ideological system of the control from the center. Then that has been going on for 35 centuries. Uh, I'm not going to expand in, in how, but let me say Milton Keynes in the 20th century already the city of Milton Keynes realized that it had to have a different uh, organic approach to that reticular and then there the, the size of the square is uh, one mile, 1.6 uh, uh, kilometers and, and obviously it's not anymore the urban block is another dimension that works for the metropolis and as a matter of fact if uh, that larger scale has been going on. And in Madrid, that, that uh, size of the square of the, of the rectangle uh, was uh, uh, 4.5 kilometers. And in uh, um, Buenos Aires, it's 15 kilometers. In, in Piacenza, in Italy, it's three kilometers. It's different depending on the culture of that metropolis and depending on, on the, of the wealth of the agricultural production. No? The, the, the better the, the land, the closer the municipalities are because they are able to live on, on that land. But I'm not going to go into that. And when you deal with metropolis, you have the example of New York from 1929 that already introduced that kind of reticular approach, 1929. So really we are dealing uh, a century old approach and that's the one that is being uh, introduced in many other places. That is New York, the two reticulas of New York. So metropolis go, from being monocentric, that doesn't work, sprawl uh, structure along the transport lines, a multipolar structure, which centrality is along those lines, but merging into fingers or polycentric structures. Out of those, three of them do not work. This uh, monocentric doesn't work, the sprawl doesn't work, the multipolar doesn't work. Uh, I, there are many reasons for it, but uh, we have no time to discuss that. We have already uh, only five minutes to go. And on the only work, the, the only one that works is the polycentric structure that I mentioned before, where you have the interstitial green areas. I think I have a larger, you know, the interstitial green areas that flow within the urban units that share a commuting, but that commuting should not be by car, should be by public transport. And when you have a metropolis of 3 million inhabitants, it's not anymore buses. No, you can have a BRT when you are in a million or a million and a half, uh, Cagayan can still have a BRT, but you are going to become 3 million sometime. And you really must think of how you should plan the metropolis to be able to manage 3 million. And when you reach 3 million, you really need a, a, a real system, uh, either subway or, or a commuter train, but that is the way of access uh, within a metropolis that needs uh, mass, mass transport. And a, a, and a BRT only allows for 15,000 passengers per day and, and a metro 45,000. So you are in a different dimension. And if you don't have the right transport mode, the, the metropolis is going to be collapsed. They will not produce and people will spend their life in, in transport rather than spending it in their homes and enjoying themselves. So we have talked about the large dimension of the 50,000 of the metropolis, but then you have to close down into the municipality and then that metropolitan plan, which will be strategic and then structural, has to dialogue with the master plans of the different municipalities. And then you close down and you have a system of how to work those uh, uh, level of, of municipal planning. And there are some rules, but we have no time to get into those rules. Madrid, as you see, Madrid looks like a, a, an oil splash. A lot of small uh, uh, cities around Madrid, but in fact, there is a very strong directionality, which is parallel to the Sierra, to the ridge of mountains. And you see the different municipalities are have a periodicity. They are apart from 4.5 kilometers. And there is a pattern that is embodied, is the DNA of the metropolis. And the planner of a metropolis must understand that pattern to, to set up the infrastructures that are in accordance and the growth of the different the municipalities and the new housing states and so on, which are exploding and you cannot do as, as in history by a trial and error process. You have to have a, a mechanism to work on that. Uh, you see that, that, that you, have, you have to work within the DNA of the metropolis and understand that DNA. And if not, you are going to make, make a mess of it. So Madrid re realizes kind of greed, metropolitan greed, and we started to build 
those uh, those infrastructures and we have been building them for for uh, already 25 years and and it really works we we had this kind of approach in the 1980s uh, madrid had a, a an inherited uh, ring road but uh, we had two main directions uh, to torrecon and so on and then in 1990s we expanded that we introduced the high speed train to the south of spain to sevilla then we introduced the metro that goes to the future airport of campo real and reaches barajas the actual airport then we introduced the parallel lines that link the two big uh, uh, diagonals of, of the of the metropolis, and and that has been going on as you see for for uh, for thirty years uh, in in building within that rationality which is consistent. And then you have made consistent environment with transport, with housing, with public uh, with uh, um, uh, productive activities and social facilities. And you have a consistency that makes that the next decision is consistent with the previous one and the different sectors are consistent in between them. So that's that's the way a metropolis has to be uh, built. No? And then you have the industrial sites and so on. We are not going to go into the details of the urban because I think that's another scale. That's the scale of, of the city, not the scale of the metropolis. And we had an indicative approach because we could not invade the competences of, of the other institutions, but we dialogue with them saying, that's what we would like to see. Let's sit down and let's see what, how, how can I compromise with you to get the best of, of work. No? And that was the result of Madrid. And those are uh, all the things that have been done in Madrid in, the la in, in 10 years. This is already 15 years old. Uh, these are in 10 years, all these decisions were made in Madrid within that kind of indicative plan that were negotiated with the different instances, sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the national ministries that were making the, uh, the airports or were making the, uh, the highways or the high-speed trains and so on. And so you see, in a, in a process of dialogue, you are able to implement a lot of things which are uh, capable. This is the diagram, the scheme of Madrid, where you see the center, you see the big di directionality of Madrid in that diagonal, and then the location of the big um, elements of the uh, metropolis that really define the structure of the metropolis, the big organs of the metropolis, like the airports, the train station, the high-speed trains, and so on and so on. And then from that kind of concept, you apply that in a diagrammatic way to the real world. Um, those uh, brown squares uh, have the are proportionate to the population in each of them, and you see the the uh, lines which are solid are existing uh, rail lines, uh, infrastructures, and the ones which are dotted is the plan of how to expand that uh, infrastructure system to make it consistency, consistent. And the orange uh, areas are where to put the new housing and the new population that they will have a uh, train service to get to the center instead of having to take the car. And that way you avoid, in Madrid, you go to your job in 22 minutes. In Bogota, it takes three hours and a half. And in Delhi, in Mumbai, it takes two hours and a half. So that's the difference between having a metropolis that has a structural plan, a strategic structural plan, and the one that just makes decisions on the go, uh, uh, this jointed incrementalist way. No? And then all these diagrams, that, that concept, you can transform that in an analogic map, and you can show exactly where those uh, uh, roads and, and, and rails and uh, housing and so on can go because you go into a zoom in into a, a scale that then you can uh, point, pinpoint more precisely. This is the, the criteria for how to develop the urban setting within our metropolis. We are not have no time to talk about that. And then you close to the urban design and the urban design is the centralities around the uh, the uh, train stations, and you see that you need seven elements, the intermodal station, where you have buses, taxes, parking, the train, and so on. Then you have public spaces, commercial and offices, residential, institutional buildings. The more you put around the station, the more people can walk or take a bicycles to the station, uh, the, the more efficient the train is going to be. The train is providing a service, but it needs a demand. If there is no one around the station, obviously that train is going to be impossible to be financed because no, no one is going to take it. And, and you have to create those centralities that induce the demand on the train. And then you are able to, to pay for the train because there is the demand there induced that is going to be able to take the train and to use the train and vice versa. Uh, 
No? And these are the results of that kind of uh, Madrid metropolitan plan. You see all the buildings uh, already built out of those criteria around the station with this kind of multi-use around the station that creates that, those uh, urban units that, uh, that we call intermodal um, urban centers. No? In Cagayan de Oro, in the Golden River, you obviously see the big, uh, the main directionalities of Cagayan, no? uh, perpendicular and parallel to the, to the coast. You have a, um, a, a gulf that really is uh, perpendicular in itself uh, because it has been affected by the location of the mountains, is the topography, the geography. The geography is, is, uh, is geometric. There is rules uh, to that topography, to that geography, and you have to understand those rules. And those rules are generally based on, on linear elements. No? So you see in Cagayan, you have there the, the main structure of Cagayan, that then when you zoom in in the urban area of Cagayan, you again have the roads uh, and uh, that have already understood, the engineers in some way understood that topography and worked within that topography. And this kind of approach uh, I've seen done uh, for the, the master plan that you're working on in Cagayan that I've been uh, talking to Mia, and, and that master plan really fits what Cagayan needs and fits this vision of the metropolis that I have been explaining um, up to now in these 45 minutes. Thank you very much for listening.